Hi there. So in this video, we're going to go through capillary exchange, how water and various solutes such as ions and nutrients are given from the bloodstream and the capillary to the surrounding tissues and how water is returned back to the venous system. The main process that we're going to talk about here, we describe capillary exchange, will be something called bulk flow. And bulk flow is sort of similar to diffusion in that, will, it will, in that it will involve the movement of substances from where there's a lot of it to where there's less of it. One of the big differences though is that the amount moved in bulk flow is much larger and at a much faster rate than what happens with diffusion. So bulk flow is very important for capillary exchange to ensure that the surrounding tissues get all the gases and the nutrients and the water that they need to survive from the bloodstream. So I have some structures labeled on here to start with. We have in red, we have an arterial end that will give rise to, in this case, three branches of a capillary. We're going to focus on bulk flow and capillary exchange in branch number one. Keep in mind that whatever happens in branch one will also occur in branch two and three. These arterial ends of the capillary will give rise to the venual ends of the capillary, which will then convene to form a venule. You also have a lymphatic capillary shown up here in brown, which we'll get to later about their functions. And then in all the surrounding tissue outside the blood vessel will be something called interstitium. You can also turn this as the interstitial space, which is going to be all the open space outside of the cells of the interstitium. Now, before we get into anything, we have to talk about the pressures. We have to define the four pressures that will play a role here in bulk flow and capillary exchange. If you can't define and describe these pressures, then there's no way that you can define and explain bulk flow and capillary exchange. So, let's start by going through the pressures shown in green. These are pressures that will promote filtration, i.e. promoting water and the dissolved solutes to leave the capillary, leave the blood, to go into the interstitium. Now we have two of them. The first will be called capillary hydrostatic pressure. It is going to be the amount of pressure exerted by water against the endothelial cells of the capillary, pushing from within the vessel, and that promotes filtration. The other thing that you have that will promote filtration will be something called interstitial colloid osmotic pressure. The term colloid refers to proteins and osmotic pressure is going to be the peer pressure, if you want to think of it that way, for water to go to where there's more solutes, higher osmolarity. So if you think about the fact that there's more proteins, that's higher solutes, that's a higher osmolarity, a higher osmotic pressure, and that's where water wants to go, where there's more proteins. It's almost as if the proteins are saying to water, come on water, come on, you wanna come over here, come with us, and water will go over there. Counteracting these two green filtration pressures, you have two purple reabsorption pressures, and the names are pretty much the same. It's just a matter of where these pressures are driving water in its dissolved solutes. So you have capillary hydrostat hydrostatic pressure, the pressure exerted by water against the cell membranes from within the vessel. You also have interstitial hydrostatic pressure, the pressure exerted by water against the endothelial cell membranes of the capillary from outside in the interstitium. And then you have plasma colloid osmotic pressure. 
It is the osmotic pressure exerted by the proteins within the plasma to draw water towards, towards them. So taken together, when you combine all these four pressures, you can get something called the net filtration pressure or NFP. To calculate net filtration pressure, you take the two filtration pressures, you add them together. You take the two reabsorption pressures, you add them together, and you take the difference. If you end up with a positive net filtration pressure, then that means the filtration pressures are stronger and you get water in its solutes leaving the bloodstream to go into the interstitium. If you end up with a negative filtration pressure, then that implies that the reabsorption pressures are stronger and you'll have water and any dissolved solutes potentially moving back into the, the bloodstream in, in the capillary. So now that we have the definitions, we've described them a bit, we talked about net filtration pressure, let me show you some numbers, let me show you some arrows so we can walk through what's going on at the arterial end for net filtration pressure versus the venule end in net filtration pressure. And you'll actually see that it's gonna be quite the opposite. So let's jump right in and I'm going to draw the capillary hydrostatic pressure first at the arterial end. It is fairly strong. You have a lot of water, fairly high blood pressure at the arterial end. The interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, which would also drive water out, is relatively weak. And I'll apply some numbers here in just a bit. The interstitial hydrostatic pressure pushing pushing water back in relatively weak. The plasma colloid osmotic pressure fairly strong because you have a lot of proteins within your blood plasma, specifically albumins. So Let's give some numbers to these, shall we? So we'll focus on the reabsorption pressures first. Plasma colloid osmotic pressure on average is about 25 millimeters of mercury. That would draw water back into the capillary. Interstitial hydrostatic pressure, let's say it's about one. You really shouldn't have much hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium. You should not have much fluid just hanging out there, because then that would be edema, swelling. The interstitial colloid osmotic pressure should be pretty much zero, because you should not have proteins just hanging around, loitering outside of cells. Proteins have specific locations, specific functions that they need to be doing. So they should be embedded into cell membranes. They should be within cells. They should be within the blood vessels. You should not have any proteins just hanging out in the interstitium. So typically it's about zero. Capillary hydrostatic pressure on average is about 37 millimeters of mercury. So if you want to calculate net filtration pressure, and we do, you will take the capillary hydrostatic pressure, 37, add it, to the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, zero. And what do you get? You get a total filtration pressure of 37. You do the same thing for the reabsorption pressures. You have interstitial hydrostatic pressure, one, plus plasma colloid osmotic pressure, 25. And what do you have? A reabsorption pressure of 26. Together, when you, add, when you subtract them, you will have a value of positive 11. 
This is your net filtration pressure at the arterial end. Therefore, you're having filtration occurring here, which is what you want. You want water to be leaving the blood along with the dissolved solute to go to the surrounding cells in the tissue that need all that. Let's do the same thing now at the venous end of the capillary. And you follow the same protocols, same methodologies that we just did. So what about capillary hydrostatic pressure? It's still there, but it's declined. You still have to take into account interstitial collared osmotic pressure. You still have to take into account interstitial hydrostatic pressure. And then of course you still have plasma colloid osmotic pressure. So now let's apply some numbers. Plasma colloid osmotic pressure, still 25. You did not lose any proteins from the blood. You should not. The interstitial hydrostatic pressure should not change because a lot of the water that just left the capillary into the interstitium will be going someplace. It's going to flow elsewhere so that way it doesn't build up in the interstitium and you get edema and swelling. And we'll talk about where that water goes in just a bit. You have capillary hydrostatic pressure. It has declined. Why? Because a bunch of water left the capillary to go into the interstitium in the arterial end of that capillary. Interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, still zero because again, you should not be losing proteins. And you should not have protein just hanging out in the interstitium. So you do the same math. Capillary hydrostatic pressure, 17, plus zero for interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, you get a filtration pressure of 17 at the venous end of the capillary. The reabsorption pressures, you have one for the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, plus 25 for the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, for a total reabsorption pressure of 26. You do the basic math, your net filtration pressure now is negative nine. Therefore, to negative net filtration pressure, you will have water and a few dissolved solutes going back into the capillary. Why is that important? You do not want water to build up in your interstitium because that will be edema. And you also need all that water to go back into the venous system so that way you replenish your blood volume, you replenish your, your blood pressure. So what are the routes that water takes? Well, water's going to take two routes. Any water that will leave the arterial end will ultimately enter back at the capillary the venous end of the capillary, which is what I just described. And that's about 85% of all water that left the arterial end will be returned to the venual end of the capillary. The other 15% of water will enter the lymphatic capillary which will ultimately drain back into the venous system. Some things that might be in that 15% of water, any kind of amino acid that by chance got filtered out, which hopefully shouldn't happen, will be returned back to the venous system. If there are any viruses or bacteria and other pathogens, th those will enter the lymphatic capillary and head to a lymph node to initiate an immune response. The bottom line here is that 100% of the water that leaves the arterial end of the capillary does make it back into the bloodstream. 
So in summary, you have four pressures. You've got two pressures promoting filtration, shown in green. You have two pressures that promote reabsorption, shown in purple. Using these four pressures, you can calculate net filtration pressure. You will see that at the arterial end of the capillary, it is positive, promoting filtration, water in dissolved solutes, leaving the capillary to go into the interstitium. The primary driving factor here, capillary hydrostatic pressure. At the venous end of the capillary, net filtration pressure is negative, promoting water to be reabsorbed back into the capillary. The primary driving factor here, plasma colloid osmotic pressure. 